We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michal Girsch. I'm extremely happy to be your host this afternoon and this YIGF meeting. Um, when I thought about what we are going to discuss today, I had two thoughts about it. To be honest, none of those thoughts is mine. Um, the first one is just two simple words, and it's Internet United, the words that are present everywhere in here. And the way I understand those words, they are a lot about equality and even change, even chances, no matter your ethnicity, no matter where you're from, what your religion is. But I think Internet United and the unity about it is about equal chances and uh, mutual respect. And this is one part that I think is most important right now when we face IGF and why IGF maybe especially. So this is one part that I thought was extremely important, just presented in those two quite simple yet very complex words, Internet United. But then when you think about it, when you think what it really is, you come up to this point where you think um, even at the YIGFs before last year, um, the one that was remote and before, we had so many bullet points, so many ideas, um, so many thoughts that this brings us to a point where we think maybe we have enough of those bullet points already. Maybe we know what we are supposed to be doing and we should start doing it. And this is where the other thought comes in. And again, it's not mine. This one was made quite popular by the great Elvis Presley. And I have the idea that this is going to be somewhat of a theme of this meeting. And this is a little less conversation, a little more action, please. And that's what this all is about. Because if you think about common respect and equal chances, equal say, um, information, access to information throughout, especially those two, almost two years of the COVID situation, you would think this information was never as strong as it is right now and as it was throughout those two years. So access to information is one part of this equality thing that we are all facing just right now. And information is one, but then we have huge challenges, um, huge threats as well, but chances that will be coming and we will be facing them. We will be trying to reach out to them whenever, whenever they show up. But access to information is one. The whole COVID pandemic has shown us how unequal the world is, how different it is in the North and in the South, how unequal it is the way that we are able to cope with that problem. So this is another thing. And the third thing, maybe, apart from this information and the COVID pandemic is probably or surely the global warming that we are, again, differently facing in the north and in the south, in the west and in the east. So those are at least three of many, many points that we are facing together. And then having back in our minds a little less conversation a little more action, please, I think is somewhat of a message that we at YIGF will be sending to IGF and we will have in our minds to always remember that we have those bullet points. We've made them very clear. Now we need to act. But if we are addressing, then we are addressed as well. So please um, welcome to the stage UN Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Dujan Min, to read out um, United Nations Secretary General written, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez's written statement. Your microphone. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. We have a so brilliant young man to moderate our uh, Global Youth Summit for the Court with the IGF. 
Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Minister Christopher Schubert, High Representative of the Prime Minister of European Digital Policy and Poland's Presidentiary for UN IGF 2021. Excellencies and distinguished participants, young people from Poland and around the world, I'm honored to be here to deliver a message on behalf of the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Good Antonio Guterres, and I quote, I send my warmest wishes to all participants in the Internet Governance Forum 2021 Youth Summit. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted both the potential and the challenges of technology. As the more and more aspects of our lives move online, we must make sure that the internet is open, free, and a secure space for everyone. That requires clear rules that guarantee our human rights and freedoms, give us control of, over our personal data, and protect us against hate speeches and disinformation. We must ensure diversity in those who create and develop new technology. And we need to address widespread concerns about giving huge cooperation, extraordinary control over issues that profoundly affect our lives. We must also accelerate our efforts to close the digital divide by ensuring that the 3.7 billion people excluded from the digital realm gain access as a matter of urgency. Ultimately, we need a new global digital compact, a multi-stakeholder agreement between governments, the private sector, and the civil society to accelerate connectivity, avoid fragmentation, protect data, and ensure digital human rights. Young people are the designers of this digital future. You must participate fully in shaping an internet that is of a force for good. Thank you for standing up for open, free, and a fair digital future. The United Nations stands with you every step of the way. That's the end of the quote. I wish you a lively, engaging event. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. And um, thank you for those very important words. Prime Minister? As we are... Um, Yes. The video. Yes. So this is what I was addressing. Let's just um, watch the video message addressed by the Prime Minister of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki. Szanowni Państwo, należę do pokolenia, które pamięta jeszcze czasy bez telefonów komórkowych i bez internetu. Ale nawet mi ten czas bez dzisiejszych zdobyczy technologicznych wydaje się nierealny. Rewolucja cyfrowa dokonała się niemal niepostrzeżenie. Jeszcze na koniec XX wieku trudno było sobie wyobrazić, by internet miał zdominować nasze życie. Dziś trudno wyobrazić sobie życie bez internetu. Tempo rozwoju technologii informatycznych nie spada, ale z roku na rok staje się coraz szybsze. Ludzie urodzeni w latach 90. są pierwszym pokoleniem, dla którego internet stał się środowiskiem naturalnym. Dziś dzieci szybciej uczą się obsługi smartfona niż pisania i czytania. A kolejne badania pokazują, że nowe technologie nie tylko są narzędziami do obsługi świata, ale zmieniają sam sposób postrzegania rzeczywistości, kształtują zupełnie nowy typ myślenia. Dlatego wiem, że to młode pokolenia mają największe kompetencje, by kierować procesem rozwoju technologii cyfrowych. Polska śmiało wkracza w świat nowych technologii. Naszą ambicją jest, by usługi cyfrowe służyły zmniejszaniu dystansów społecznych i poprawiały komfort życia. Ale widzimy również, 
że na tym nowym, nie do końca rozpoznanym terenie pojawiają się także ryzyka. Zagrożenia dla naszej prywatności, czy ryzyko oddania kontroli nad naszym życiem w ręce wielkich korporacji. Wiemy, że internet to przyszłość, ale do nas należy decyzja, jaka to będzie przyszłość. Pewnych decyzji nie możemy oddać w ręce sztucznej inteligencji. XXI wiek należy do Was. Jesteście najlepiej wykształconym pokoleniem w historii ludzkości. I jestem pewien, że dokonacie rzeczy, o jakich moje pokolenie nawet nie śniło. Dlatego z wielką uwagą będę obserwował debaty w ramach Szczytu Cyfrowego IGF. I już czekam na wnioski i rekomendacje. Wiem, że to właśnie tutaj wykuwa się przyszłość świata i życzę sobie i Wam, żeby to była przyszłość najlepsza z możliwych. This was the message by uh, the Prime Minister of Poland, Mr. Mateusz Morawiecki. And now, if there were words about those calls to action, then please welcome to the stage you've met already, Mr. Krzysztof Schubert, High Representative of the Prime Minister for European Digital Policy and Poland's Plenipotentiary for United Nations IGF 2021. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, IGF youth community. As the Polish government plenipotentiary for United Nations Internet Governance Forum, IGF 2021, I'm warmly welcome you in Katowice. I'm so pleased to be here with you, even the COVID-related conditions are not really that favorable. I have a honor, as was mentioned, of being the high representative of the Prime Minister for European Digital Policy. To be honest with you, I'm a former business person as well, former Secretary of State, Oxford University visiting fellow, and the most important from my perspective and this meeting, long-term IGF and MAC member. So the interactive dialogue with the young generation is extremely important to me. These days, Poland became under the UN umbrella, the heart of international debate on the future of internet. We have been trying to get this opportunity for several years, and finally we succeeded. The UN has granted us efforts and actually um, international ar arena and has granted us the IGF host country role of 16th edition of uh, United Nations Internet Governance Forum. Just to recall that the UN IGF has been organized annually since 2006. Today it has been held in many countries, including Germany, France, Switzerland, Mexico, Brazil. This time is for Poland and the next year for Ethiopia. Dear guests, when preparing for the sessions uh, and having in mind the audience, two areas resonated the most, digital technologies and investment and funds. Let me start with digital transformation. During the COVID-19 crisis, digital technologies, as well as the internet, proved to be strategic in organizing our lives to the extent we would never foresee before. We have spent this time as well very productive here in Poland. Because the time is very limited, I will just give you a few examples. To support health and law enforcement authorities, we launched the home quarantine monitoring application and vol voluntary contact tracking tool called Protego Safe. This day, we rely on the solutions to control and stop the spreading of COVID-19 virus. Another tool which proved much useful is the online patient account this application gives Polish citizens access to all medical data, prescriptions, referrals, other information. But most importantly, we use this system to facilitate access to vaccination program. The service allows you not only to set a date for a vaccination, but also generate COVID digital certificate. Furthermore, in 2017, we have created a public mobile application called mCitizen. It's a digital wallet uh, for documents and services. It allows you to store most important services and documents like personal ID, student's ID, driving license, or of course, COVID digital certificate. The application is used on daily basis already by six million citizens in Poland. Concluding few words on the investment and found. So first of all, it is crucial to support startup and SMEs such they play a very important role in digital transformation, developing new products and services, which is a key for the future. 
Today, innovation in 70% is within digital space. There is constant, continuously more and more difference found available on the market, starting from national programs, international programs, in case of the European Union, we have quite a lot of digital oriented programs, as well in the venture capital space, private equity, and the latest co-investment funds supported by public money. By the way, this topic will be dis we will be discussing more in details tomorrow in high level plenary, investing in digital growth. Dear IGF international com community, again, I'm very happy that we have met today online and on site in Katowice, the city of innovation and the hub for new technologies. I wish you a very interesting discussion and findings today. And please do not forget to join the high level sessions today and later tomorrow. Please do not forget as well to share your opinions on IGF in Poland, in Katowice, on social media using the hashtag IGF2021. The future of digital world lays in your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, especially maybe for the words that covered um, international cooperation in the area of internet and um, electronic services as facing those challenges of the last two years would be probably impossible if it wasn't for that. But if we are talking about um, international cooperation, this would not be possible without the uh, foreign service. So please welcome to the stage, Mr. Arkady Zagotsky, head of the Polish Foreign Service. Excellencies, Minister, distinguished guests, but first of all, you, dear youth, the most important young uh, participants of this summit. It's my great pleasure to see you all gathered here today in Katowice in Poland to discuss the challenges you observe in different areas of internet governance. Therefore, I would like to highlight some areas where the role of young people in digital policy making is crucial. New technologies have an increasing impact on our daily life, including national security, which can be both positive and negative. Worryingly, they make it possible to launch effective attacks on, among other things, critical state infrastructure and spread disinformation, all at a relatively low cost. Recent years have seen an escalation of disinformation activities, especially in cyberspace. Even though young people are considered uh, digital natives, recent developments in technology, easy access to the infosphere and social media's increasing use as the first source of information all give rise of wide array of challenges. Disinformation is one of them. Many studies show that this information spreads, spreads six times faster than the new news, and that is disseminated primarily on social media. Because of this new challenge, as the head of the Diplomatic Academy, I stressed that the modern education must be expanded with dedicated modules of digital diplomacy, cybersecurity, and combating fake, fake news along with other forms of disinformation. That is why Poland is also stepping up its cooperation in these matters with many other countries, such as, for example, UK, Lithuania, Estonia, Germany, Romania, the Netherlands, and the Czech Republic. Such partnership allow an in-depth analysis and search for new training solutions to address these challenges. In a long-term perspective, it is imperative to put emphasis on providing internet users with unbiased access to reliable information, raising awareness of this information and building resilience. In this context, youth has a major role to play. You are one of the earliest adopters of digital content. What is more, you are the most active internet users, sharing content, content among friends, among others, 
and discussing the news both online and offline. In an obvious way, you are also exposed to fake news and disinformation. But on the other hand, youth have the admirable qualities of being sensitive to falsehood as well as questioning and verifying information. That is why I believe in and call for a cautious approach to all unchecked and unverified information. I'm absolutely convinced that the role of the digital awareness educators could be facilitated by young people, mainly due to, to their high level of digital skills. In the face of unprecedented challenges related to disinformation, joint efforts are crucial to enhance media literacy and social, societal resilience against false narratives, for example, through educational materials for local communities, including schools, neighborhoods, universities, associations, and local fact checkers. As an academic, most of my life, I have worked with young people trying to pass on my knowledge to them. Today, I learn a lot from you, how to find yourself in the digital, digital reality, how to communicate, how to promote Poland and the region of Central Eastern Europe, while at the same time fighting disinformation and cyber attacks. So I believe that together we can build sustainable and inclusive digital ecosystem. I'm looking forward to your proposals and to our future cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, especially that together with, um, with the YIGF um, uh, a committee, just before YIGF, we had pre-events. And what you have just mentioned, we have especially addressed, which was the issue of disinformation and how important it is um, nowadays to not just have bullet points about it, but take action about um, addressing disinformation as it becomes one of the most dangerous, probably, weapons, even if it does not have real bullets. Um, and cooperation on the say, international level is, of course, extremely important. Um, and we will be discussing this as well. For his remarks, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Pierce O'Donoghue, Director for the Future Networks at Directorate of um, DG Connect at European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished guests, ministers, your excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here speaking to you, and I'd like to thank the Polish government for its efforts over two years to organize uh, the IGF, which is so important to us uh, in the European Union and beyond. Uh, and now the way that the IGF works is also very important to us. These are things that we take seriously, uh, and that is why this focus on the role which younger people can have in shaping the Internet of today and in deciding how the, op the internet works tomorrow is essential for us. Because as several speakers have already underlined, we are going through a major transformational moment and the COVID crisis has, if anything, accelerated that. I don't have to tell you about what the impact has been, but we do certainly see that as well as the reliance on electronic uh, tools and technologies, the use of the internet and, and online technologies it also, of course, forces us to reflect on the downside, particularly exclusion, digital exclusion, those who cannot connect, those who do not have a safe, trusted and open connection to the Internet, and how that reinforces in a negative way some of the exclusions that we see across the world. That has to be a focus of the IGF. It is certainly a priority of the European Union and the European Commission. So we have uh, a focus on ensuring that there is a framework for how the internet operates. Those rules are not intended to control the internet and they are not intended to stifle innovation and to stop the technology from developing. For that, we need a very strong input from our stakeholders, the non-governmental actors, to ensure that we do not overstep our obligations, that we do not either limit or control the internet or allow others to do so, using regulation as an excuse, but also that we have a forward-looking, innovative uh, and imaginative approach to how the internet can develop. 
we have to ensure that the internet is a force for good. So we have to tackle the realities of the problems. The fact that uh, power in the internet is in a, num a small number of, of, of economic players. We have cyber security incidents which threaten security, but also the data of individuals. We have disinformation, as has been said, we have illegal and in harmful content. Now, all of those come with all of the good things that the internet can bring us. It's just the case that here in this discussion, we, to a certain extent, we have to focus on the negative elements because that's where our focus should be. While we allow the internet community, the non-regulators, you, the innovators, to actually develop and decide what that positive evolution is. The European Union, we are trying to combine the vision of regulation and freedom. That may, in some people's minds, be an entire contradiction. And those voices we need to continue to hear as they are our uh, consciences, as it were, as we do this work. We have to create an environment where innovation is allowed and supported, but where actions which limit or attack the freedoms of others are stamped out. We have also to share the benefits to ensure that everyone has access to remove this serious issue of exclusion, digital exclusion as we see it. And that is why uh, the European Union, for example, has just launched the Global Gateway Initiative, which is a project that aims to bring the internet, the open internet to all parts of the planet and aims to empower a bottom-up approach uh, to the different regions, to the different questions that have to be tackled in internet governance, in the running of the internet now and in the future. We have a few red lines, of course. Most importantly, we insist that the internet of the future is completely respectful of fundamental rights, that we need to have a framework of digital principles, which may need to be adapted according to local traditions, religions, and of course, culture. But at the same time, there are guiding principles at a human level, which we must all work for to have a human-centric internet. Secondly, we have to ensure that the ecosystem is entirely inclusive. And that is something which we're doing with other international organizations and governments through the IGF, through the United Nations, and of course, in supporting economic actors and NGOs who work with the same principles in mind across the entire globe. But this model, which is multi-stakeholder based, shouldn't be taken for granted in the sense that it can be under threat. We must not be shy of calling out behaviors which by being perhaps extremely liberal end up being harmful to the internet. We need also to ensure that governments, starting with our own governments, are very careful about the actions we take. We heard in another session already today uh, how about taking down of websites in one region may not be appropriate in another region because of dangers to free speech. That is something which means that we have to pause for reflection. That is something which shows the role of youth IGF because it is the young people who will create greater awareness and who have greater understanding who will enable us to achieve our objectives of diversity and empowerment. And I think the best way for me to close is to say, you've just heard several middle-aged men talk to you about these important principles. Happily, that's going to change in a moment, but it is actually our sincere belief that the generational change must come quickly and we must have a more diverse, inclusive and open face to the global internet. Thank you very much. If I may just add one sentence to that. Um, all of those men come from whatever we want to call it, the global well-developed north that has its perspective, but it's, I would say, kind of conservative, or at least it misses probably a lot of progress um, that's in perspective there's um, ahead of us and Ethiopia is of course one of those countries especially that you will be hosting uh, IGF next year so please welcome to the stage Ms. Huria Ali Mahdi State Minister of Innovation and Technology of Ethiopia. Thank you so much. Good afternoon.
Excellencies, ministries, distinguished guests, user representatives here and those across the globe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are hearing this message. I was very pleased when I received this kind invitation extending extended to my country, Ethiopia, so that I join you to address this summit. I was pleased because it was an honor and a privilege to represent not just Ethiopia, but our continent, Africa, which is a young continent with an energetic, innovative, and inspiring generation. One of the huge potential of our continent, Africa, is its young population. Recent data shows 60% of African population is under the age of 25, which makes Africa the world's youngest continent. For instance, Ethiopia, the country I am proud to represent here today, has a population of more than 112 million. Among this, the youth population between 15 to 29 is at around 25 million. In Ethiopia, more than 300,000 youths graduate from universities every year and join the job market. There are more than mere figures. For us, these figures are indicators and drivers of economic and social development we wish to bring to our people. To this end, Ethiopia introduced its first ever digital strategy, Digital Ethiopia 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, Digital Ethiopia 2025 at last strategy, realize the digital economy extends beyond just the availability of digital products and services. Several interlinked elements such as connectivity in systems, comprehensive laboratory environment, digital interaction, and ecosystems are essential to create a thriving digital economy. The Ethiopian government is also diligently working on the digital skills of the youth to equip them with the skills to meet the employment requirements of a digital economy and embrace innovation and help maintain competitive edge. We are doing this because we believe with the right technology, enabling system and legal frameworks, the youth, the youth could change the continent and the nation. Governments, civil societies, academia, and the private sector should assist the youth to change the internet in, into knowledge, innovation, and job. I would like to argue the youth, particularly those in developing nations, to exploit the opportunities of the digital age to their and their society advantage. You are the hope to your society and your nation. You are your own future. Do not waste this change that many generations before you did not have the opportunity to get. Let me conclude my remark by wishing a fruitful discussion and expressing my hope that the outcomes of this youth summit strategic ways that will enable the advancement of internet governance for use all over the world. Finally, as the next host, the IGF 2022, on behalf of Ethiopia, of people and my government, we look forward to seeing you all in Addis Ababa, the capital of Africa. Amasek Gnallo, thank you. Kuya. Take on what you have just mentioned about age, but not age-wise only. Um, probably the next IGF would be more of an Y IGF than any of the IGFs before. Um, thank you very much. And um, last but certainly not least, please welcome Mr. Wojciech Pavlak, the director of NOSC Institute.
Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the global youth community on organizing this event in Katowice. It, it wasn't obvious under these gloomy COVID circumstances, uh, so I'm truly impressed with your commitment and determination to participate in the world debate on internet future. For us, it is a great honor for NASC, National Research Institute, to become the patron IGF uh, uh, youth Summit in Poland and co-organizer co to this session. NASC connected Poland to the internet almost 30 years ago and most of, of our activities similar, similar to, to multi-stakeholder approach as uh, the IGF itself. We have great science on the board. We implement cybersecurity programs and products in delivered to the market. As a, a DNS registry, one of the largest registries in the Europe, we have technical and legal look on the internet, and we also cooperate with the government and NGOs, ensuring that what is on the internet is safe for the users. So NASC fits the IGFs like a globe. That's why we cooperation with youth IGF is so important for us. After all, it's a great pleasure of working with you with the new United Nations and Chancellor of Prime Minister um, uh, Mateusz Morawiecki in preparing this event. The times are, the, uh, they are changing as put it once Bob Dylan. And I strongly believe that internet governance, internet futures in your hands, in the right hands of young people eager and engaged. I keep my fingers crossed for the summit in Katowice, wishing you all successful meetings and Good stay in Poland. Thank you very much. Certainly, if the times are a changing, then this is maybe time for a little less conversation, a little more action, uh, just combining Bob Dylan and Elvis Presley today. Thank you very much, um, distinguished guests. We understand that um, some of you or maybe all of you have other duties that you need to attend. So thank you very much for being with us. We're, of course, not finishing. Thank you once again. And um, to be honest, uh, from the very beginning, I was kind of uh, pretending um, in terms that I'm not the real host of this event. I have met the real hosts before several times. We had discussions, we had pre-events. But now I want you to meet the real hosts of YIGF, who are the members of the YIGF community. So please welcome Emilia Zalewska, Marta Musidłowska, and Rafał Prabucki. Hello, everyone. My name is Emilia Zalewska, and I have a great uh, I have a great pleasure to welcome you all here today. I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to speak for you, no matter if you are attending online or on site. So thank you very much to the organizers of the IGF for making this happen. Today, together with my colleagues from Free Youth Initiatives. Youth Coalition on Internet Governance, Youth Observatory, and Youth IGF Poland, we will have the pleasure to present you the results of months of our hard work. But before this presentation, together with my colleagues, Rafał Prabucki and Marta Musidłowska, we would like to introduce to, to you to the ideas and the process that led us here to this place. It has all started with suggestions. Almost a year ago, we received uh, after the last year's IGF. We have had an opportunity to carry on a lot of conversations, consultations with other young people. And in most of them, usually there was one thought that came to the fore. And it was the need to get more inclusion of young people into policy-making processes. 
It was how to find new ways to connect young people with decision makers. It was how we could transform the postulates that will be created at this youth summit into the actual performance. So as it was already quoted a lot, how we could have a little less conversation at a little more action. I think we are quoting some writers quite a lot here. So hence, we decided that this year we will focus on those policy making processes. So we will create the specific proposals of solutions that could be implemented in the various areas of internet governance. To highlight their practical dimension, we call them points of action. So we wanted each of them to answer three key questions. Firstly, what is the challenge? Secondly, what is the solution to this challenge? And the third one, who could support us in implementing this solution? What I would like to put in the spotlight in my short speech today is the third part. It is the importance for young people to have support of somebody more experienced. Because if we took a closer look on some exemplary stories of youth who achieved success in different fields, we could usually observe some pattern then. And this pattern is the presence of a mentor figure, somebody more experienced, already successful, who noticed the young person, their ideas and their potential and decided to support them. Without such an assist, a lot of brilliant thoughts by young people would just disappear in the void. So here today, you are the first broad audience, such a broad audience, in front of which we will present the final results of our project. The points of action, which are specific forms of expression of our ideas as young people in different fields of internet governance and the challenges we observe there. So we are asking you to listen to these ideas and support those of them that you find valuable. You are representatives of governments, local, national, and international organizations, academia, private sector, and many others. And you already have experience, knowledge, resources that we as young people still need to gain our career path. And it will take us some time. So here today, we are asking you to support us. His Excellency Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his message for the International Youth Day said, I urge everyone to guarantee young people a seat at the table as we build a world based on inclusive, fair and sustainable development for all. Today, we are inviting all of you to our table. And what we hope that we will also find a place waiting for us at yours. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Rafał. Thank you. I will show you a little bit about technical stuff. Sorry for this. Yes, so the preparation for the project was very specific. It was an action packed with numerous twists. Uh, we started by gathering knowledge and inspiring the others on the topics we wanted to cover at the upcoming IGF summit. Our first months uh, of activities involved attending meetings where we presented the newly formed IGF chapter and collecting contacts among experts. Finally, after many conversations, most of experts gave us a helping hand, which has led to a series of inside meetings as our first step to a way to Internet Governance Forum in Katowice. After this 
amazing meetings, it was time for our participants and partners to define themselves, what they would like to help us with. We also announced an open call for people willing to commit their whole heart to our project. And these data, data are amazing. Over 200 people from all over the world applied, representatives of different age groups, genders, and sectors. People of different countries and cultures applied to work in the subject teams. We all came together to work collectively. The strength of our work was the response, which allowed us to achieve diversity. The slogan of this sum summit is united together. However, in order to come together in pandemic times, we needed a place to exchange ideas. To design work took place in groups on a Discord platform. We also used numerous instant messengers. In this way, we created a whole digital IGF youth village, a place where everyone could present their view, their solution, their thoughts. The young lawyer saw what the young engineer thought. The youth European resident go to know the problems of the youth ASEAN uh, resident. Everyone could step out of their zone of knowledge, culture and belonging to see how incredible complex the world is. All this time of pandemic that separates and restricts us, but the internet has overcome all difficulties. In addition, we have to communicate to the global community what we do. To do so, we use a social media platforms. Everyone was able to follow our every step, accompany us in our difficulties and even learn with us or speak at our meetings. It was an amazing journey. Thank you. In the name of our already mentioned what words, less conversation, more action, we decided to start working a few months before the IGF. We knew it wouldn't be easy. We had to trust not only our intuition as to how the project should proceed, but also the people who volunteered to help with the project, many of whom we had never met before. Today, standing here and soon listening to the results of many months of work on problems related to particular areas of internal governance, I cannot help but be amazed at how many great and original ideas can come out of an international, cross-sector, gender-neutral and politically neutral debate focused primarily on finding answers to the three questions mentioned earlier before. I can't help but admire the fact that we managed not only to create a space for the most inclusive discussion, but also a discussion that forced us to go beyond our own information bubbles and look at what solutions to a given problem have been adapted on the other side of the globe. Project Youth Summit Inc. accomplished its most important task. We no longer ask for a voice. We simply wait for an opportunity to act. This will cul culminate in the release of an official report containing all points of action with their descriptions. It is easy to see that what we have accomplished is based on what we have learned from the very essence of the IGF multi-stakeholder, diverse, equal, and inclusive work. We are honored to win the, a place in the agenda of the forum where it all started. The success of the entire project could not have been possible without the help of our colleagues from NASC, who have taken care of us from the very beginning and at every stage of the project. At this point, we should also mention two irreplaceable ladies, Anya Gengo and the IGF Secretariat, as well as Anna podgórska bompane and the Chancellor of the Prime Minister of Poland, thanks to whom we have the opportunity to share the results of our work with you during such an excellent conference as the Internet Governance Forum. The points of action, however, would not have come into existence without the collaboration of several youth organizations. Thank you to all the members of the Youth Observatory 
and the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance, whose commitment and active participation in the development of the project has only highlighted the true power that lies within the youth. Speaking of young people, thank you to all the participants and coordinators of the Project Youth Summit, who demonstrated not only a wealth of knowledge in specific areas of internet governance, but also the ability to actively listen to those who have different opinions or experience in a particular area. We would like to thank all mentors supporting the work of project participants, as well as other entities which gave us a helping hand at particular stages of the project, especially the Silesian University of Technology and the University of Silesia, who provided us with an excellent space for further networking, because as we all know, the most fruitful collaborations are born behind the scenes. The internet is present in our daily lives, mainly to help us communicate. We might come from different places, backgrounds, and have opposite views. But at the end of the day, we aim at the same thing, to stand together and have the internet united to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and especially that Marta mentioned the uh, Chancellor of the Prime Minister of Poland. Um, we have one more address um, from Piotr Mazurek, Secretary of State at the Chancellery of the Prime Minister, Government Plenipotentiary for Youth Policy. Szanowni Państwo, uczestnicy IGF-u, uczestnicy szczególnie Młodzieżowego Szczytu Cyfrowego, bardzo się cieszę, że mam możliwość skierować do Państwa kilka zdań. Niestety ze względu na zaplanowane wcześniej obowiązki nie miałem możliwości przybyć stacjonarnie do Katowic, ale wszystkich, zarówno tych, którzy stacjonarnie w Katowicach, jak i zdalnie uczestniczą w tym wielkim wydarzeniu, serdecznie pozdrawiam. Gratuluję tym, którzy doprowadzili do tego wielkiego sukcesu, jakim jest fakt goszczenia w Polsce tak ważnej międzynarodowej imprezy, Szczególnie oczywiście gratuluję panu premierowi Mateuszowi Marawieckiemu, ministrowi cyfryzacji oraz panu ministrowi Krzysztofowi Schubertowi. Kwestie, które są poruszane podczas tego szczytu, takie jak związane z rozwojem nowych technologii, kwestie związane z wolnością słowa w internecie, kwestie związane ze sztuczną inteligencją, to są tematy szczególnie ważne dla ludzi młodych, zarówno w Polsce, jak i w wielu innych krajach. Dlatego też zajmując się na co dzień polityką młodzieżową, wspólnie z Radą Dialogu z Młodym Pokoleniem, staramy się jak najmocniej wspierać polską młodzież, aby uczestniczyła w międzynarodowych dyskusjach wokół tych tematów. Dlatego też zorganizowaliśmy już kilka miesięcy temu debatę poświęconą wyzwaniom etycznym związanym z rozwojem sztucznej inteligencji. Uczestniczyło w niej 8,5 tysiąca przede wszystkim młodych osób z całego świata. Myślę, że debata ta zakończyła się ogromnym sukcesem. Dlatego też w trakcie naszego grudniowego wydarzenia odbywają się panele zorganizowane przez Radę Dialogu z Młodym Pokoleniem, panele w międzynarodowym z Kładzie, poświęcone wyzwaniom związanym z gamingiem, poświęcone kwestiom związanym z wolnością słowa w internecie. Staramy się, aby przedstawiciele polskiej młodzieży mieli tutaj możliwość wyrażenia swoich poglądów, swojego wkładu w tę międzynarodową dyskusję. Bardzo dziękuję wszystkim, którzy doprowadzili do tego, że mamy taką możliwość, że w igf ie znalazło się bardzo wiele miejsca dla młodych ludzi, że ta dyskusja może być prowadzona serdecznie. Gratuluję, życzę owocnych obrad i raz jeszcze kieruję, wszystkie, kieruję specjalne pozdrowienia do wszystkich obecnych zarówno na miejscu w Katowicach, jak i do osób, które uczestniczą zdalnie w IGF-ie. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you for the message, by the way. I love the gaming part, but this is kind of an inside joke. But seriously, uh, I treat it very um, seriously. It is an important part as well. Uh, the thing we're not now coming to is Well, it came from months of work and meetings, by the way. I want to thank you for um, one of those graphics that resembled the, the thing that we have, the, the discussion that we had with our friends and partners from the NGOs actually around the world. Some of them were working on educational needs of the refugees in the refugee camps in Greece. 
Um, uh, one of them was a person responsible for media literacy trainings um, and education in um, UK outside of London, especially in those poorer communities. We had lots and lots of people who were actually very much concerned and focused on what media, media literacy is and what facing disinformation should look like. And this was just one of those issues that were covered during those pre-events. Now we want to discuss them. We want to discuss our action points and then maybe hopefully put them into action. First of all, I want to call the Universal Access and Meaningful Connectivity Group to share their action points. Thank you, everyone. My name is Rasha Tanusi. I'm from Benin. I'm a telecom engineer, and I serve as a communication officer for Internet Society Benin chapter. So during a few months, uh, during a few months, I work with uh, many people on universal access and meaningful connectivity. So I work with uh, some participants like uh, Fred, Dina, Enoch, Francis. And we have the spot of uh, Lydia, Hush, which is our mentor. So, next slide, please. So when we are talking about uh, universal access and meaningful connectivity, we see today that internet is very important and uh, the importance of internet is well demonstrated now. But, uh, we, we are still facing many challenges. And uh, uh, you know, COVID pandemic situation show that this is very important to have a good internet and a good connectivity. But we are still facing some challenge in our communities, in our region. So for example, in my country where I come from in Benin, to get one gig of internet data, you need to use uh, $1. And even this is very slow. So we are facing many challenges. And with my colleagues, we come up with many recommendations that I will let them pre to present to you. So over to you, Fred. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ben, for that quick introduction. Uh, hello, distinguished. Uh, ministers of state, all members present, or protocols observed. I'm Fred Kwajo Azori uh, from Ghana. I am an IGF Youth Ambassador for the 2021 group and also a member of the Universal Access and Meaningful Connectivity Working Group. For the work that we did, uh, someone would ask, uh, why are we giving uh, these points of actions, which seems to be streamlined on specific uh, sections or aspects that we decided to select uh, and present as our point of action? The issues with regards to access and connectivity, meaningful connectivity, is quite a lot. So we decided to uh, get an overview of everything and grouped it into eight major subheadings of which I'm going to present on infrastructure, connectivity, and lack of devices. First of all, when we look at the infrastructure aspect, I think the slide is not showing. Uh, I don't know if it is just me alone, but uh, I can proceed with it and the technical team can work on that for us. So access is to gain connectivity to the internet in itself. Then we look at meaningful connectivity where after someone have gained access to the internet, 
the person has to be guaranteed of a reliable connectivity. If the person is guaranteed of a good connection, then the person can be said to receive a very good connectivity or meaningful connectivity as we put it. So with regards to infrastructure, we identified two main issues here. The first one, we said low quality and expensive access to the internet is an issue. And we also realized that the single point of failure due to the existence of limited internet exchange points is also an issue. With this, we identified some solutions and stakeholders that could possibly assist in getting this remedied. And so we, we say that governments in collaboration with technology companies and funded by international aid agencies, which include the IMF, the World Bank, and other agencies that support developing countries and even the developed countries to be able to uh, provide internet access to its communities. We believe with these investors coming, working together, they'll be able to work towards improving the internet backbone and enhance last mile access through active public-private partnership. Additionally, community networks has become uh, the mantra of the day and everyone is talking about community networks. We also realize that it is true that community networks would be able to assist in promoting access to connectivity in most of the areas that do not have access as at now. And the UN uh, research indicates that we have about 37% of the global population that are still not connected at all to the internet. Other research findings also indicates that about half the population of the globe are also not connected at all. And we have people who or communities or countries that are connected, but do not have meaningful access due to some different issues. With this, the issues are also the challenges like low speed, bandwidth, prohibitive cost that encourages or uh, discourages or prevents the common public from accessing it, the internet. And so we urge city, municipal, local body administrators, governments and universities with the technical assistance from telecom providers or telecom industries and the internet service providers that they should consider opening their existing connections, keeping in mind the security that has to be in place anyway, as well as try to create new local hubs at prominent high density areas that they provide for their students, employees, travelers, citizens, and the, uh, the lot that we can mention in this case. And all of this is to assist in making sure that everyone gains meaningful connectivity. Apart from the connectivity, we realize that those people that do not have access to the internet Sometimes it is not that there is no infrastructure or there is no internet connection or uh, network mobile connectivity available within their communities, but they have lack of access to devices. And so the devices that enable people like you and I to be able to remain connected to the internet is very essential. Today, I am able to sit in my room in Ghana to speak to all of you and everyone at like who is listening or would watch this recording in future, that the benefit of the internet is realized when the individuals or corporate organizations or everyone has access to the devices that they will be able to use to connect to the internet. And so our group, 
indicates that to tackle and the increasing cost of acquiring new devices, especially in developing and underdeveloped economies, and high amounts of electronic waste. I think you can go to the next slide. And high amounts of electronic waste, companies associated with device, cable, electronic goods manufacturer must adopt repurposing, refurbishing, recycling, and open systems in line with secular economy principles, and also practice net carbon neutral commitments in achieving this. Krishna will take over from here. Thank you, Fred. Uh, excellencies, ministers, uh, delegates, uh, and all those joining us today, uh, both in Poland and around the world. Uh, I'm Krishna. I'm a health tech entrepreneur from India. Uh, and today, uh, I will be speaking about the literacy and the disabled and uh, gender-related access issues. Uh, could you please move to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in the healthcare space, there is a significant improvement and today life expectancy across the world is increasing. With this, traditional forms of employment is facing uh, serious challenges. With this as a brief context, uh, it is essential for all individuals, be it young, adults, children, all the way up to senior citizens to be equipped with digital skills to not only participate in the internet and in the digital transformation that's taking over the world, but also save themselves from the risk of unemployment. So with this challenge in mind, we looked at embedding digital literacy uh, as a form of curriculum across age groups, across different verticals, be it in school, be it at university, and extending onwards for employees working in a corporation or a startup or in the government. Next slide, please. Uh, beyond literacy, we looked at the other issue of access uh, from an angle of uh, gender and from an angle of disabled access. Uh, beyond that, today the world is dominated by the North compared to the South uh, in the sense that there are thousands of languages globally, uh, but the internet today is limited uh, significantly to content in certain five to 10 languages. Uh, this coupled with lack of disabled access in the sense that someone who's blind, someone who's autistic or deaf cannot easily access the internet. We as the youth urge that the internet must become more open and more accessible for the youth and for those who are disadvantaged. In that context, we believe that standards like the ARIA standard and support for local languages should become mandated by law. Uh, and I being an entrepreneur, I understand that there is a significant hurdle for SMEs like the minister pointed out to adopt or comply with legislation. Therefore, we believe that large corporations, governments, libraries, and support groups play a significant role and have uh, the resources to mobilize to ensure that there is more access uh, and meaningful access for those who are disadvantaged due to linguistic or disability reasons. Uh, thank you. With that, Dominique will continue the presentation. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you very much. Um, I will continue with the point of safety. And safety is an important point because everyone who uses the internet has to feel safe and it's like a safe space for everyone. So it's important that like uh, platforms, social media platforms, for example, search engines, etc., that they use like uh, filters against spam, abuse, and troll detection like with AI and they, it's very important to really include like demographic and like gender and social views and sensitivities. And we can accomplish that 
like beyond physical safety training, also like with cyber hygiene training and safety training. And it has to be like a crucial part in the education of the digital education of, um, of each and every one, each of every single users of the internet. Next slide, please. Okay, next point is security. And security, also like safety, uh, everyone has to feel secure in the internet and um, it has to be like, security has to be provided. So the problem is that many people like fall prey to transnational, for example, financial crimes. And um, we have like pointed out some of them, like man in the middle attacks or like phishing or ransomware. And our like we propose that like countries and security regional sub-regional hubs with representative um, from law enforcement. Uh, we pointed out some of them like Interpol, EU, or like one of these else, and that can actually coordinate and uh, streamline cooperation and detection prosecution of cyber criminals uh, without discrimination on the extent of financial loss or geographic boundaries. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. And with the emergent of, or like with emerging technologies, not only problems arise, but also like new ways or new methods that can be incorporated like digital or e-governance. So that concept of digital or e-governance provide us with so many more opportunities. And like, for example, we pointed out that citizen service delivery and political engagement can be like made easier, more transparent and like corruption free for the poor marginalized of downtrodden by governments across national and region, uh, regional and local levels. And like through adoption of service delivery, like for example, with support, with funding support from international aid agencies and like institutions, investors and technical support from technology telecom companies across verticals, for example, ranging from healthcare, education, justice, essentials, agriculture, et cetera, is digital first couple with transparency practices like automatic updating and reporting of aggregated data and service uh, rendered beneficiaries and beneficiaries and impact made. Uh, thank you for your attention and yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, this was very elaborate. Thank you for a lot of effort that you've put into it. Now we need to um, speed things up. Um, so without any further ado, um, digital education group, please. Thanks guys. Um, thank you so much. Um, greetings to everyone. Um, my name is Rodrigo Alexandre. I'm from Uruguay. Uh, I'm glad to be representing the South. Um, today, uh, we are represented with my uh, friend Mauricia uh, from uh, South Africa, uh, the group of digital education. Um, so first of all, we would like to um, address uh, that we uh, choose to agree on a certain definition of the terminology of uh, digital education, uh, because we uh, realize that is a terminology that is under construction uh, even today. Uh, so we um, we think that it, it, digital education is even more than in education in the, in the 21st century or the, edu, the digital age. It's about the methodology used, the, um, the, the skills and the competence acquired to learn, to learn in this uh, constant training and applies, of course, uh, not only for students, but also uh, for teachers and the whole education educational system. And of course, it means much more uh, than face-to-face and distance uh, learning. Uh, so thank you so much. And now I'm going to give the floor to my uh, friend and teammate, uh, Marisha. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. And greetings to all of our distinguished guests. All protocols definitely observed and hello from South Africa. Digital education comes with many challenges and access to quality digital education is profoundly unequal. We face both external factors and individual factors um, in terms of challenges. So the challenges would include both infrastructure challenges, digital competency challenges, 
on behalf of our, or on the part of our end users, and also on, on the part of our educators. Um, we also face external factors and challenges such as a high, um, a lack of high quality learning content. And again, on an individual basis, we face challenges such as a lack of basic, basic digital skills, a lack of digital literacy, uh, a lack of good knowledge and understanding of data intensive technologies such as artificial intelligence. Um, we also need advanced digital skills for procedures and have more digital specialists involved. Um, so we are facing a challenge in this aspect as well. And most importantly, there's a challenge in ensuring that girls and women are equally represented and have access to digital spaces, studies, and also for their careers. So one of the points of action we came up with is um, that of digital education and gender and the gender digital divide for girls particularly as it pertains to their participation and training in digital education. We face challenges such as um, infrastructurally, geographical location difficulties, where our women and girls travel far distances in order to be able to access the internet or send something as simple as an email. They also face difficulties with balancing household and relational responsibilities. They face physical mobility challenges time constraints, as well as still battling with hegemonic norms and values in many countries across the world. What are our solutions that we have proposed? We propose that we develop innovative education systems and platforms that can go where women and girls are, including zero rated online classes from their tablets or their mobile phones. We propose that there be awareness and skills transfer opportunities, and that this also be zero rated, in meaning they shouldn't have to be accessing the Wi-Fi all the time in order to access the information that they need. We also propose that connection, there be a connection to a network that provides information on current opportunities for mentorship, further development for their careers, for their work, jobs, and platforms to speak and affect change, such as the Elevate Her Africa Network. We also ask that all these programs have clear schedules and, have, and be mindful of time allocations to make sure that women and girls are able to balance all the challenges that we've mentioned, such as balancing the household and their relational responsibilities and still have access to quality education. We also propose that for women and girls who are active in forums such as the Global Internet Governance Forum that we are part of today, that they be an accommodation for mothers at these global fora, including accommodation or daycare facilities for career moms and caregivers. We also propose that they be a multi-stakeholder approach to all these initiatives, including of policymakers, NGOs, and civil society and more. On the part of our point of action on digital education, as it pertains to digital literacy, shortages among education stakeholders. We know that the challenge is insufficient teaching and learning digital literacy skills, abilities, and platforms amongst our stakeholders in education, but also a lack of readiness on the part of our government structures. So we propose that they be a creation of policies in support of expansion and implementation of digital education on a national level. We propose that they be continuous capacity development for our teachers and all their collaborators. And that also there be opportunities to collaborate with the private sector to expand technology infrastructure in all areas. On, an, on a traditional level or traditional media level, we propose that there be continuous campaigns to promote, encourage, and highlight benefits of digital education on all traditional media platforms. That there also be a dedicated time slot for edutainment content for young people as well as adult learners. On the level of our faith-based institutions, yes, you have a big part to play as well. We encourage the support and advocacy for inclusion of all genders in traditional and religious education opportunities. 
We also ask that our faith-based institutions offer regular community learning venues at the level of incorporation of our cultural authorities. We ask that there be a promotion and upholding of inclusive and equitable cultural practices that empower all genders. And last but not least, we ask on our social entrepreneurial platform and spaces that our entrepreneurs take point and note of what we are sharing in our working groups, in our youth platforms, and here at the Global IGF, so that youth-led initiatives apply the knowledge that is learned during our exchange opportunities. And last but not least from my side, on the point of action as it pertains to digital education in light of including or addressing the digital inclusion divide, whether it be social, economic, or as it pertains to health barriers. We know and we are aware, and we highlight once again, that there is still an exclusion of persons with disabilities or special situations from our digital education platforms. And this does not exclude our elderly communities. We must address the mistrust that our elder com elderly communities have towards digital innovation. And how we will address it is by including them in our initiatives. So we propose also that there be a creation of accessible features and alternatives on our digital platforms. For example, have there be offline alternatives, low definition graphics. We must have an ongoing collaboration between governments and other educational stakeholders to draft new and inclusive policies that oversee this implementation in support of digital education. Remember, the multi-stakeholder approach is a great way to solve and to work towards the solution that we have um, listed the points of action to. We must include the involvement of digital education platform owners, developers, special needs educators and users, all supported again by government-led policy solutions bottom-up community-led initiatives and civil society. On that note, I hand over to my more than capable um, co-presenter, Mr. Rodrigo, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Marisha. I will try to be brief with my uh, last uh, three points of actions. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, the digital uh, education and infrastructure and barriers. Uh, of course, uh, this point of action refers to most, uh, mostly an infrastructural uh, problem, uh, the lack of internet connectivity. And of course, uh, it's uh, important to mention, the other group mentioned it, and it's always a, a great idea to, to address it. It's that 50% of the population is not yet connected. And of course, the people connected uh, has a lot of issues uh, related to the, the internet connectivity. There is much more than the, the, the only the connection. There, there is a quality of service. And of course, there are many regions of the world that are facing more, even more uh, uh, worrisome needs, like the, uh, the problem with the, the lack of electricity, even, or more basic needs. Uh, so of course, addressing this, uh, this problem, it's always uh, um, important. Uh, um, next slide, please. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the policy implementation. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, trying to be uh, in a hurry because of the time. Um, uh, again, uh, this is a very uh, important uh, thing to, to mention because uh, the policy implementation should be based on principles uh, because there is um, many, many things that we have to address, especially uh, the differences between countries, between regions. Uh, so we we, uh, we see that the, there is a big problematic when we try to go into point A from, from point A to point B. Uh, there is a lot of goodwill in the digital education implementation, but there, we need more than that. Uh, we need more than goodwill for our governments. We need, uh, of course, to address the importance of good cooperation between the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, ecosystem, but of course, the uh, different levels uh, from our governments, the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level. 
uh, and these implementations should be uh, guided for this uh, multi-stakeholder approach, uh, emphasizing the importance of the communities, the different towns, the different cities, especially uh, those who are excluded, even the, uh, in, in the traditional ecosystem, for example, uh, the rural areas. Um, so this is, uh, uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to give you my last point of action. Uh, the other one, please, the before that. Yes, thanks. Uh, and of course, uh, this uh, process should be based on data analysis. It's important to know uh, which problematic we are facing. It's important to, to know which uh, 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 problems we are facing in the implementation of digital education. Uh, um, of course, we have to, um, uh, we are uncertainty about the, the right and the responsibilities and the duties of the different actions, but uh, this uh, uh, implementation should be transparent and should be clear for everyone to see where the resources are, are being implemented in every uh, digital education process or digital education plan uh, that uh, a government, an institution, or, or the whole multi-stakeholder uh, ecosystem is uh, uh, facing. Um, Again, uh, we we emphasize this uh, multi-stakeholder approach because knowing the needs of the of the people and 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 having them involved, it's important to succeed in this twenty uh, one century uh, education. Uh, last uh, slide, please. Uh, and of course, we 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 can uh, we can do it. Uh, so nothing can stand in a way of, of power of millions of voices calling for change, and especially we, the youth. Uh, we are the change, so the digital education is the answer, and the time is now, uh, even during and after the pandemic. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm going to give the floor uh, to the auditory and the uh, environmental sustainability and um, climate change team. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Um, this was this was very interesting. I just want to ask everyone to remember we have um, several points coming, and we have time for this until like six-ish, and then we have to proceed. So um, as far yeah, it's like you know six minutes per group. Please, we have to stick to the um, to the schedule. So now, as was just mentioned, please welcome Environmental Sustainability and Climate Change Group. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you can hi. hear me well and fine. So thank you for this opportunity. I am the coordinator for the Environmental Sustainability and uh, Climate Change. We are a group of eight young people, uh, eight enthusiasts of environment or uh, uh, environmentalist, uh, you can say, uh, with the uh, different specializations uh, pertaining to law, uh, PhD, uh, engineering, information science, uh, and biology. And uh, together, we have come up with a unique point of actions in the field of uh, environmental sustainability and climate change within the realm of uh, internet governance. And with the guidance of our able mentors, uh, Jevon from, uh, who is a, uh, who is a, PhD holder in the field of environmental uh, sciences, uh, majoring in uh, waste technology, Elias from the European Commission, and Thomas from uh, a senior biologist from the Polish uh, Research Institute. We have been able to form these uh, postulates. So without uh, any further ado, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to read out the aim of our group, which was to uh, seek opportunities where uh, environmental footprint can be reduced through sustainable practices in the area of internet governance. And with this uh, motive, motive, we have uh, proceeded to form the point of uh, action. So can we move to the next slide, please? So yeah, so very first uh, uh, point of action that have come uh, uh, 
uh, from our uh, team is climate change, technology, and data centers. As we all know that uh, we are living in the age of uh, modern era, where modern technologies are making disruption, be it artificial intelligence, be it blockchain. So these have been some disruptive uh, technologies, including the robotic process automation, which have been uh, as a result of uh, information science and technology and computing technology uh, especially and uh, what we uh, do know is uh, that these kind of technologies also emit a, a large number of uh, uh, emissions from the data centers or from the computing uh, blockchain uh, related uh, mechanisms because uh, these computing uh, systems require a, a, a series of computers and see these series of computers when uh, in tandem they emit a lot of volume of emissions uh, which can be very harmful for the climate and for the environment as well so what we have thought uh, uh, as a solution is that through a multi stakeholder approach where uh, technology companies people from academia and uh, also from people from academic background come together and uh, come to consensus uh, where green technologies can be a solution to uh, uh, or can be taken within the framework of these uh, technologies so adherence to greenhouse gas reduction as per law and set guidelines set by uh, the United Nations, uh, for example, the sustainable development goals that were there. Uh, so the UN SDGs, the 17 sustainable development goals. So if these new technologies can, uh, within those framework of SDGs can uh, transform themselves, then it can be a win-win situation for the larger uh, generations. And uh, who can help in solving this agenda is uh, 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 ma majorly the primary owner would be data center operators, operators or the private stakeholders or the technology companies that are there. But uh, a very active part would be played by the government as well in uh, making sure that these emissions are not uh, crossing the limit and the emissions are under control and within the realm of environment as well. So now we can move to the next slide, please. Next comes uh, the uh, issue of uh, quality education and access to information for uh, environmental action. Now, this pertinent uh, point of action of quality action education can be extended to all the uh, existing uh, uh, sub-themes of internet governance that are there. But within the realm of uh, environment and uh, merging it with the uh, internet governance if we see our group has uh, uh, sought challenges of digital divide or uh, internet connectivity and awareness among the masses uh, which are some of the key aspects uh, in this point of action so how it can be solved is through a quality education framework uh, with equal fitting involving all the youth stakeholder uh, along with uh, the senior academia that is there and develop a syllabi where uh, principles of environment in sync with uh, in sync with other major main subjects could be incorporated so this will create awareness uh, among the masses and uh, challenges of digital divide or connectivity and awareness could be abridged through this uh, who could be the main uh, stakeholders who can help this? Uh, definitely youth can be a key enabler since uh, it would be the future lawmaker or future as future activists or future uh, uh, academicians. So we have to think uh, uh, of this particular aspect uh, from an environmental point of view as well and see where uh, we can have an interdisciplinary approach uh, in our subjects as well because environmental uh, is a field which is which has a common link in all the key uh, aspects of technology as well too so uh, for this uh, we recognize that we uh, we uh, had a consensus that we urgently need to recognize this issue and incorporate this point of action uh, at all basic le levels of education to improve the standards and this basic level differs from country to country. And in some of the developing countries, there is an urgent need because there is a lot of digital divide and a lot of uh, 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 technology is not able to reach the very rural parts of those areas. So their technology can be as an enabler. For example, it can be used for women empowerment and uh, side by side, it can be a sustainable technology as well. So that will give uh, a good combination where uh, environmental aspect is also touched upon. So now we can move to next <clears throat> slide, please. 
so uh, now we have the ecological aspect of uh, environment so as uh, information and communication technologies are the key is a key player in the internet governance realm as well and it is more uh, uh, becoming common day by day so a lot of emissions are generated as a result of these technologies which causes uh, harmful impact to the environment and uh, disrupts the ecology balance that is there so how can uh, a very streamlined approach that our group thought on the basis of its research was that it can come through energy efficient systems and innovative circular circular business models so uh, these energy efficient systems can be incorporated in data centers or it could be uh, incorporated in day to day activities of the information community technologies those can be small uh, activities in the purview of uh, internet governance but it makes a huge impact when uh, taken as a consolidated uh, me measuring uh, component for the environment so uh, and these innovative circular business models uh, can be very vital for the youth uh, stakeholder as well since uh, this is the youth summit so uh, i believe this is the right platform to encourage and motivate the youth to come up with these uh, innovative circular business models uh, which can have energy efficient systems and uh, addresses uh, the uh, ecology balance and also the dichotomy of uh, profits and environment at the same time uh who can help in solving this issue uh, then uh, again we have all stakeholders play a major ro uh, role in this uh, in solving this issue especially the government uh, the technical and also government can fund uh, the circular business models or young entrepreneurs uh, who come up with these models and maybe they can bring about uh, disruptions in green technology for tomorrow so this ecology aspect was considered as one of the major point of action for a group can we move to the next slide please the next come uh, the uh, framework of uh, governance for uh, environmental policies uh, since a lot of uh, policy makers are here so this would be the right platform to raise uh, this uh, issue of uh, regulation of technology technologies in terms of uh, environment as a key assessed, uh, assessment criteria a lot of uh, environmental impact assessments are done uh, in the uh, manufacturing sector when uh, any industry has to be set up so similar kind of framework uh, can be taken uh, for, for the uh, any uh, information science or information or technology setup and uh, these guidelines could help uh, uh, young technologies or even the technology companies uh, to have a framework in mind where they know the goals or they know their purview for which uh, Uh, they cannot exceed uh, and uh, they know the limits uh, until where uh, the environmental damage is not done and through this standard framework uh, a lot of uh, carbon footprint can be reduced now this can be achieved achieved through a multi stakeholder uh, and a bottom up approach because a lot of challenges there uh, in the very remote places where there is no uh, governance framework and uh, a lot of emissions uh, are uh, out there so that is why even the data centers are sometimes uh, set in the remote places so if they are done uh, so, uh, with a governance framework uh, having environmental policies clauses then it can make a lot, lot of impact and uh, for this we will be needing a uh, 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 support from the government at all uh, levels and especially from the non government organizations through advocacy where they can uh, uh, do survey and uh, tell the government as to how much emission is being uh, raised by a particular set of uh, or a subset of uh, <clears throat> uh, it uh, sector uh, data centers and then uh, present the report uh, and uh, advocate for uh, bringing about a uh, change in the policy and those policy level changes can make a huge impact in addressing this uh, uh, area so a good governance framework for environmental policies can definitely be go a long way for to achieve the sustainable development in internet governance as well can we have the next uh, framework please so uh, our next uh, the second last uh, framework is of the menace of electronic waste and its uh, impact on environment a lot of debate has been going on on how electronic waste has been one of the key polluter across the globe a lot of organizations included the including the united nations the world bank the united nations environment program have been working to address uh, this challenge of uh, electronic waste and uh, they have come up with the uh, 
solutions like uh, they want to uh, amplify the approach of 3R, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. And uh, a lot of stakeholder cooperation and innovative circular model, business models is required in this area as well. These circular business models can be uh, uh, centers where uh, these electronic waste are treated uh, in a biologically degradable manner where it doesn't affect the environment or uh, uh, some mechanism is made where uh, this electronic waste can be uh, reused into something uh, or reproduced into something other, some other substance. And uh, a lot of case studies are there, which our uh, World Bank uh, group also launched uh, uh, its pilot program in African countries to encourage entrepreneurs to come up with uh, uh, centers uh, where electronic waste can be treated. So a lot of work has been done, which is beyond the purview to talk about in this uh, uh, short presentation. So uh, this was also one of the uh, major issue of uh, pollution in the field of environment and falling within the purview of internet governance. And we believe that through campaigns by governments and other uh, support from other stakeholders, we will be able to address it. So now I will be moving to the last slide and then I will be wrapping this. Can we move to the last slide? So the last uh, slide we have is of uh, circular economy in the age of internet. So this circular economy we believe is driven by coherent and inclusive global digitization in the purview of internet governance. And to uh, keep rolling the circular economy, we'll uh, uh, concerns pertaining to sphere of uh, cyberspace has to be addressed. And also along with the dis uh, disparity in accessibility of internet, how it can be done is uh, through open uh, software platforms, facilitated uh, uh, data and uh, data privacy or to prevent monopolization and data breaching that is happening across the globe. And uh, this will, uh, try to uh, have a balance between uh, inclusive global digitization and uh, also it will give accessibility to the wider aspect and roll the circular economy wheel uh, for, as per the uh, consensus of a group. Now the major stakeholder that can uh, assist uh, us in this is the government, the civil society, uh, the industry associations and the customer itself because it has to be aware with the green mindset that uh, it is part of the larger circ circular economy wheel and thus it has to incorporate the green digital lifestyle. So these were uh, some of the key uh, uh, point of actions uh, that our team noted, and we will also be publishing the white paper at the end of the youth summit. So I hope you all enjoyed. And now I would uh, like to uh, request uh, the committee of uh, to hand over to inclusive internet governance ecosystem and uh, digital cooperation team for their inputs. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, Mohammed. And uh, as just Mohammed uh, mentioned, let's move to inclusive IG ecosystems and digital cooperation. Dear youth colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to share the outcomes from several months of work at the Working Group of Inclusive Internet Governance Ecosystem and Digital Cooperation at the IGF 2021. My name is Eileen Cejas. I'm from Argentina. I'm part of the board of the Youth Observatory and the steering committee member of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Created truly inclusive internet governance ecosystems and proper digital cooperation is a challenge the community is trying to tackle, looking towards the future of internet governance. As you know, inclusive internet governance and digital cooperation includes a wide range of topics which the usage of digital cooperation structure is key in ensuring that all voices are respected and taken into consideration by all the stakeholders. Through the background, background paper and the points of action, we analyzed and recommended several actions that should be taken into consideration for all the stakeholders of the IGF, IG ecosystem with the goal of inspiring youth voices into the conversation at the Youth Summit and beyond. We choose this topic because as youth, we think it is important to contemplate the current work streams and the proposed architecture models in order to suggest points of action uh, for the stakeholders in the, to consider for the upcoming years. We researchers research sorry, through various documents like the roadmap for digital cooperation and the UN Common Agenda with the technical support of expert mentors from the internet governance field. For our working group documents, we have chosen as reference for the analysis the point number seven of the 
UN Common Agenda regarding improved digital cooperation. And from uh, the Common Agenda, we picked also issues that we consider relevant, um, taking into consideration the Global South perspective. We also had the great assistance of two great mentors, Ms. Ilona Stadnik from the St. Petersburg State University of Russia and Mr. Roberto Zambrana, MAG member and coordinator of the IGF Bolivia. And we are very thankful for your support and contribution, contributions during these weeks. Now I'm passing the floor to Vlad Ivanets, a brilliant member of our Royal Working Group, who will explain the points of action. Thank you all. Uh, hello everyone, I hope you can hear and see me well, and I just switched on my presentation. Uh, sorry about this trick, but I hope that uh, it is allowed, uh, so anyway, we can uh, come back later to the previous one. Uh, anyway, there are some results of our working group, and um, I need to say that while working on the final uh, points of action, we've been um, taking into account the three main um, moments, and one of them is uh, the youth participation itself, uh, because for us it's uh, uh, enormously important. The other one is the IGF reform and transition to IGF plus that is uh, uh, that is coming in the five years, and we believe that IGF will become an IGF plus. And the third one is the role of NRIs um, in, uh, in this process. And uh, also we've been putting some attention to, the, uh, to many other details and aspects of uh, digital um, cooperation and internet governance ecosystem. Uh, so our first point of view um, is uh, on equal participation in internet governance processes. And I will uh, simply uh, put on the table some thoughts uh, that were crossing into our working group. Uh, and I, I'm not going to stop uh, on each point of view. I will just uh, bring you some ideas that uh, we had. And uh, while working on this uh, point of action, we've been thinking about representation of each group inside the IG community, and especially uh, in the IGF as the global forum and as the main um, event that uh, combines together all the opinions and aspects of internet governance. And um, we decided that sometimes we have some groups that are underrepresented under uh, during the sessions and during the event, and especially, for example, academia. And uh, right now we have, you know, this battle between uh, big tech companies and uh, their self-regulation and also government with their legislations. And uh, what we expect from IGF is that this process of uh, picking up different representatives of different groups will be well balanced and it will become a system of checks and balances and all participants will be well represented. So the second um, point of action is representativeness in IGF decision-making bodies. And um, here we talk about uh, the transform, the reform of IG, IGF. And uh, we also know that the new body, the multi-stakeholder high-level body is going to be presented. But uh, what we want to have is um, to understand who is going to be nominated uh, into this body. And uh, we want to, to hear the clear instructions and to see them at these clear instructions uh, of how these uh, representatives are going to be elected and nominated. So that's what we uh, also expect from IGF. Uh, the third point of action is about IGF as a hub of result-oriented discussions for policy making. Uh, as you know, IGF is uh, sometimes meets many objectives uh, and um, some criticism uh, from the community for being uh, the platform for discussions only. And what the uh, community expects is that IGF will become a platform for real uh, decision making. Um, and that uh, in, in a way it will, uh, it will be more repre representative, re more representative um, platform uh, where different uh, representative of different groups uh, will be ready to uh, make an agreement and you know, follow their commitments and they will follow up the plans of actions that, uh, that are announced during this or that event. Okay, uh, moving to next to the fourth point of action is about equal access to digital goods. And we also know that um, IGF uh, 
um, invites different um, organizations, uh, businesses, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, some of them are the large, uh, larger and bigger ones. And um, you know those who are smaller, for example, startups or small businesses, they are lacking uh, some information. They're lacking data, um, and we want IGF to provide uh, more tools, more equipment, and probably more data uh, to to these under underrepresented uh, companies. And uh, we want again uh, to to create the balanced uh, system inside the IGF. So the fifth point of action is about raising awareness about new technologies for inclusive policies. Um, yeah, at IGF, we are trying to discuss uh, hot topics, um, but sometimes, you know, the uh, whole agenda of IGF is, uh, um, is, it is that complex uh, that sometimes some um, aspect that are really important for the global community is simply excluded or not really visible for the global uh, for the broad audience. So uh, we expect that we expect that uh, such team as artificial intelligence, uh, Internet of Things, uh, um, uh, cyber uh, currency, and uh, many other issues, foreign issues, will be well presented at IGF, and they will. Uh, and they will gain more uh, attention from the uh, organizers. Uh, the sixth one is really important for us. It's about youth involvement in IG policy making processes, because uh, we talk in a way too much about youth involvement, youth engagement, but there are not really uh, strict actions about, about that. Um, and uh, while working on this uh, uh, concrete um, point of action, we've been uh, thinking about, you know, a possibility of creating um, and uh, nominating IGF as the independent um, uh, stakeholder, but then we refused from this idea because uh, at IGF we already have many different um, initiatives, uh, and they, uh, in a way, uh, you know, contain uh, some representatives from from youth. Um, and what we expect is just to, um, you know, Im improve and develop uh, already existing platforms and initiatives that uh, were created for youth, especially, for example, youth coalition, youth uh, dynamic coalition inside the IGF and make it more visible for youth participants uh, from different countries. I'm just uh, going to ask one thing, Vlad, please, um, two minutes, and uh, we got to wrap it up, seriously. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Right. Uh, the seventh one is uh, learning from a crisis through thinking hybrid formats to promote further engagement. It's all about the online participation. For example, me, myself, I participate online, but uh, all of us, we are really tired of online participating, of online meetings, uh, but we need to improve them and make them more interactive and uh, more engaging for the audience. Um, and we also want them to be safe uh, because uh, today we also talk about, uh, you know, some uh, psychological problems that people have uh, in the post-COVID era. Um, and we also meet them as well. So uh, we expect uh, this hybrid format to be improved and online participation to be enlarged. Uh, the eighth one is user-friendly IG platforms and resources. As you know, uh, the IGF website is not uh, really uh, friendly for, for the users and even the um, experienced participators, they meet some problems uh, while observing the program or just navigate, navigating through the website. So um, it's the new uh, task for, uh, you know, backend and frontend developers to make it more user-friendly, especially when you want uh, to engage uh, more um, young um, participants because you know we all live in the uh, uh, clip uh, society and we all think uh, uh, as a visioners um, yeah so visual uh, visual aspect is really important and we expect from um, IGF community to work on the online on their online resources um, yeah the ninth uh, point uh, the ninth point of action is about increasing uh, the linkage with IGF global and the uh, national local and uh, regional IGFs um, uh, via uh, use and arise as well. Um, so I think it's clear, and we can move to the uh, to the last one. Um, it's about embedding human rights in digital cooperation architecture models, and um, 
this one is really important because, you know, we, we have different countries with different uh, legislations and so on. And sometimes um, our conversations and our talks uh, lacking uh, human rights as the basis. And we really want to keep it uh, for the all um, for the old conversations and discussions that we have at RGF. So I hope you can look through all of these points of actions uh, during the, uh, when they will be published on the website. And here I will stop and thank you for inviting us today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, guys. Just so you know, we have like 15 minutes at this point. We have already skipped one um, and there's still four groups to go. So um, you do the math. Um, then moving on and please, please just stress the most important parts of your speeches, emerging regulation, market structure, content data and consumer users, rights regulation. There you go. Um, yeah, there's one at the table. So we have the presentation. No? Okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, my name is Alina. I represent Emerging Regulation Group. I'm from Russia. So we'll be just brief and quick. Uh, so for our main topic, we choose distributed ledger technology. So, and this is the new emerging technology. Uh, and it's uh, emerging and disruptive innovation with an expanding range of potential application. But unfortunately, to the DOT, uh, it is not regulated uh, well enough. That's why we chose it as our main topic. Can we have next slide and the next slide? This one thing. So the basic challenge is lack of clarity on how the technology is governed. So basically, we should make a significant effort to educate people about the development of DLT. And of course, the main helper here is the, the technological community because it's the one who knows the better. Next slide. So the second problem is uncertain legal status. Even though some countries have legal and policy frameworks on different aspects of the DLT, it is still necessary to harmonize them as well as to develop uniform measures to regulate DLT. Uh, for instance, like to create an international convention of supply of digital content and digital services. Uh, and maybe thinks uh, about something like the law of cyberspace. Um, so the next, please, data management. Of course, as you know, DLT is a technology that focuses primarily on new approach to data management. And digital data is the basis for the existence of the internet. Meanwhile, um, it is necessary to build a legal framework, like, for example, Digital Data Protection Treaty to define legal status of digital data, but not only the personal one, like in GDPR, but also in include ownership rights over virtual assets, like NFT. And so the next slide, because it is connected. As you know, that NFT now exists as a work of art, but the main problem is that the lack of clarity of who and how owns it. So the main issue mostly concerns copyright, which is regulated at the national level, primarily by the Berne Convention. Meanwhile, the latest revision of the content of the convention is already more than 50 years old, so it should be updated. And maybe the, uh, we should rethink the concept of exhaustion of copies of a work and to extend the first sale doctrine uh, to intangible copies of work. So the next one. This is actually, when you talk about DOT, you usually think about financial markets because DOT is commonly known to be used in, as a financial instrument. But unfortunately, there is no existing regulation of this completely new and previously unknown technology. So we should think that um, in order, sorry, uh, we should think that apart, uh, probably the conversation should be started about how technology should be governed. And the second one, um, the adoption of open catalogs of financial instruments, which is with the clearest possible criteria for their identification. And maybe um, such things like how we test in US law can be bring up as an example of it. So the next one, standardization. Actually, someone stole this slide uh, in the digital education group. So you maybe you saw it. Um, the, what we uh, propose, we should propose the adoption and development of standards for identification, privacy, node recognition, data governance, user consumer rights, auditing, forensic investigation, and regulatory review, 
restification errors and logging. So who can help with it? Of course, international uh, ITU and maybe original working groups on that matter. The next slide. This is actually the tough one because when you talk about DLT, you don't think about regulation of digital platforms, but it is connected, especially in the times when we have metaverse all over the, the world. So probably digital platforms, it is time to question their rights and responsibility towards ordinary users and national governments. Uh, so, and it is important to work on regional regulatory strategies as an initial part towards world strategies. Uh, and so um, what we propose uh, to keep platforms up to date with the new laws in their country of operation concerning DLT technologies or any other technologies and regular exchange of opinion between IT giants uh, and governments, not only with the country where they operate in, but also in other countries and with free access of users and ability to ask questions. So on these meetings, all the concerns must be voiced and if possible, settled. Well, uh, so regional platforms, uh, parliaments and organizations are the ones that can help with that. And so the last point of action is DLT ethics. So uh, as you know, tokenization is part of DLT and it's a great tool to monetize a business, but uh, it also allows us to monetize a person. But the question is, where's the limit of following the profit? And what if a person is tokenized without uh, their consent. So we should initiate a discussion on the ethical problems of tokenization and create a working group on the creation of the DLT uh, ethical code, like AI ethical code, for example, within the international organization. So the last slide. Uh, just to conclude, uh, we can say that Web 3.0 DLT develops very rapidly, but unfortunately, its regulation is like two steps behind the real uh, possible position. So we should probably uh, develop not only new regulation, but also new approach uh, to dealing with digital laws. So thank you very much. Thank you. I mean it. Um, moving forward, um, cybersecurity. Uh, dear friends, uh, my name is Mohammed Ali and I'm from India. I have a background in computer engineering and uh, I'm doing research in machine learning and uh, computer vision. So uh, our colleagues have already taken a lot of your time, so I'll be very quick. There are five challenges that we have considered. We have come upon distilled after many discussions. The first is malware as a service. Malware as a service is a very pressing issue because uh, just like we have drug cartels, there's a, a big underground network of uh, malware as a service that is being provided uh, in the dark web, especially. And we must uh, curtail them as soon as possible because otherwise they might go out of hand very soon. And then there is a, another challenge that we are facing is the issue of cross-border cyber attacks. Cross-border cyber attacks are also very, uh, very uh, can be very threatening because uh, if you look back a few years, there was an event in uh, Ukraine where the uh, electricity, electricity grid was completely down in the winters. And yeah, it can adversely impact a lot of other critical infrastructure as well. So the third uh, challenge that we are facing is uh, tracking and attributing uh, cyber attacks. Because of the inherent nature of the uh, internet that it is distributed and uh, it is a lot of time uh, very decentralized as well. So it is very difficult to track and attribute who has done the cyber attacks. And that brings a lot of difficulties in uh, persecuting uh, those people and those organizations. So we need to uh, tackle this as well. And the fourth point of action that we have come up with is uh, digital upskilling. Because uh, we are using the internet, but most of us don't know what goes behind the scene. And uh, humans are also the weakest link in the cyber security field as well. So only with uh, proper education, we can tackle this issue. And I think that will be very important. Like uh, we, are, we are seeing that in Estonia, uh, they mentioned that uh, they, are, uh, they have incorporated uh, cyber hygiene in their primary education as well. So maybe we should take a lesson from them and we should implement it everywhere around the world. And the final point of action that we have is uh, regarding cross-border scams. It uh, perhaps doesn't come into many discussions usually, but it uh, 
primarily it originates uh, it originates from the global south and the uh, target is the uh, north america primarily so but uh, because in uh, humans are involved and because of the issue of uh, uh, because there aren't any uh, uh, multinational or uh, any international convention regarding these so most of the time nobody is persecuted so justice isn't uh, ever delivered so these are our five points and uh, we have recognized that uh, who can uh, how can we solve this uh, we can solve this by uh, i think just like uh, in the convention sense of security in the physical security the primary responsibility lies with the platforms and the governments and uh, they will be solving this they will be solving this using the multi stakeholder approach by uh, bringing everyone on the table and yeah and then uh, coming up with a solution and then i will just like to caution with one point that uh, we see that uh, the distributed nature of the internet is uh, the concern the cause of most of its problems but we should also consider that it is also the its biggest strength so we should never uh, curb this part of the internet we should always keep it open and free and then we can uh, use the multi stakeholder approach to find solutions thank you thank you very much and the seventh group is privacy and data protection hello everyone my name is benjamin chong castillo our coordinator of the privacy and data protection group uh, and mexican lawyer on digital law and together with me uh, abdias zambrano from panama participant of, of this group and 20 and 20 i saw uh, IGF Youth Ambassador will be present the uh, points of action of our group. We're going go, uh, to go as fast as possible because uh, there's still one group left to, to present. So, yeah, uh, I'll skip the, the introduction, but I would like to mention uh, the importance of the personal data protection and privacy is a relevant and key issue in, in any sector, uh, mainly due not only to the rapid advances of technology, but also to the digital transformation. So. Uh, that has increased in, in, in many countries since the pandemic, uh, how it was mentioned at, at the beginning of, of, of the session. So next, thanks. Um, personal data literacy, uh, with Rogue, it was uh, important to, to put this point of, of actually uh, as, as the first one, because uh, the issue of, of, of education is, is paramount if, if we want to strengthen the protection of, of personal data. What, what happens, uh, in terms of, of privacy is that a large part of the population around the world is not aware of how important uh, the, the, their data is, either because they, they are uh, unaware of, of it or, or because neither the, the authorities nor, nor the institution in their countries have given data the, the important it deserves. So the first challenge we face in privacy and data uh, is, the, is the literacy campaigns to, to protect, promote, respect, and and ensure personal data in all countries, in, in all region, and, and all the, the work for a human rights uh, approach. Next. Thanks. Um, this is a multi-stakeholder uh, engagement on, on privacy with this point of action. We, we intend that through dialogue, we, we can involve uh, all stakeholders in many occasions, the, the discussion of regulation and, and legislative uh, reforms remains only in, in one sector. However, it's important that there is the participation of, of all uh, to create policy that are effective, that really serve for or, or what we uh, want to achieve. In this sense, uh, participation must be inclusive and uh, attending uh, to all sectors. This point, uh, this is important that uh, users know uh, the way in which the different private and public companies collect and use their, their data in order to create different uh, alternatives that promote the protection of their fundamental rights in the, in the handling of their, of their data. Next, uh, this point. Uh, this, this point is related to, to the fact to the fact that, that, that in many applications or internet services yes is the next yes is this thanks uh, this point is related to the fact that, that, that many application or, or 
or internet services happens that in order to use it, sometimes uh, we are we are asked uh, for personal data that are not always necessary for the for the service. In this case, what what, uh, what we want to, to protect are the principles of proportionality and propose as must be applied uh, in in the processing of, of personal data. The fifth point of action ensure that the technology the technology and tools used by the collector of personal information are suitable for unambiguously identifying the user in order to promote respect and protect human rights. With regard to this point of action, the aim is to address from a human rights perspective one of the most common problems that currently exists in many countries, phishing through theft, th through identity theft or usurpation. The main objective is to strengthen two important aspects, security and authenticity of information. The next slide, please. The sixth uh, point of action, draft recommendations targeted to the private and public sector about best practices in the treatment um, of sensitive personal data, mainly focusing on health, privacy, and tracking. With the pandemic, it became even more evident how much information companies can have about us just by carrying our cell phones with us. In addition to our location, our device records a lot of other information without us necessarily being aware of it. On the other, in the other hand, we have health information, sensitive personal data that must be protected with our great efforts. The next slide, please. Promote personal data rights in special sections of websites and applications with clear and understandable wording of users. On many occasions, the terms and condition, conditions of websites, applications, and digital content in general are often written in a very technical or stilt manner. The above then shows that the consent given for the processing, the processing of personal data is not even conscious, a serious problem right now. And the last one, the next slide, please. Establish a standard framework to regulate the right to be forgotten regarding the storage of personal data granted and the revocation of consent to the processing of such data. In conclusion, to address the issue of personal data and privacy, it is necessary to do so from a human rights approach. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, we will move to the award ceremony shortly, but we still have the eighth um, presentation about the super interesting topic of artificial intel intelligence. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Pajaro. I'm the coordinator of the artificial intelligence group. Well, we... Uh, we came up with these three main challenges that we found after two months of conversations. Will you please? Okay. So the first of these challenges was a uh, equity. The, we came up with three main points of actions. The first one is it is among nations. All nature uh, um, with this. Uh, with this, we agree that all nations should be uh, an annual meeting where all the stakeholders, including government, discuss, discuss and take measures in the development and the incremental adoption of AI in ethical and the standards. Equity within nation, that means, no, I can't see it. Equity within nation in order to take internal inequalities and challenge the difference between global north and, sur and global south in the development, implementation, and the deployment of artificial intelligence. And the third in this AI equity is equity in AI liter literacy. That means that governments, academies, civil society, and the private sector to, more, to promote educational programs, uh, uh, scholarships, policies, and other opportunities that allow people from the global south may, uh, may, may, and may and understand how to design, the, develop, and deploy artificial intelligence. Now I go, I give the word to my co-host today is Sona. Yes, Sona. thank you very much, Juan. I'm here. 
Uh, hello, everyone. So, uh, continuing with this presentation, it should be mentioned that the further the development of artificial intelligence technology continues, the more likely it is that this technology will not comply with human rights and principles. Of course, artificial intelligence provides a huge number of new opportunities, we know, both in the field of the medicine, business, education, and in financial sector and uh, science. And it's important to understand that governments, private firms, developers, and system users all have inherent responsibilities to ensure that artificial intelligence is not intentionally, intentionally misused or unpredictably harmful. So here we have our points, but irreparable consequences and take control of the situation with the development of artificial intelligence, such as a necessity of training artificial intelligence, uh, such as development and deployed uh, artificial intelligence, so firms, private sector, universities, public sector, and other involved should have a great emphasis on monitoring live uh, artificial intelligence models. And of course, we have regulatory artificial framework. This next slide. Yes, here we have future artificial intelligence risks and opportunities. And we uh, highlighted here uh, several uh, points like artificial intelligence interpretability. Traditional technology officers should prioritize price mechanism over grants to encourage innovations, uh, which meant clear success benchmarks in AI interpretability. Of course, we have authoritarian artificial intelligence. Uh, this is about a uh, violation of human rights and spreading artificial intelligence technology to support authorities. So we have to do something that uh, artificial intelligence goes in a way of opportunity and in a way of uh, uh, side that we can use in a, a good way, not in a harmful way. And of course we have existential risk where stakeholders should collaborate and pursue a research agenda on existential risk to humanity from artificial intelligence and recommend solutions to mitigate those risks. Please, next slide. Yes, Juan. So the invitation is to work, to make artificial intelligence as a force of good and a new kind of technology center in all human necessities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I'm seriously sorry for cutting you short, but um, this is a sprint, and now we're at the, almost at the finish line um, with the award ceremony, ceremony of the Wiki Youth. So, Anusha Alikan. Okay. Thanks. Hi, hello, everyone. My name is Pedro de Pejigolana. I am a board member of the Youth Observatory and of Creative Commons Brazil. I have shortened my speech a little bit so we can have time to end it on time. So first of all, I would like to greet my colleagues who made the Youth Summit possible. I do this in the figures of Emilia, Marta, Rafael, Eileen, and Juan, and Shadrach, among others. It's always a pleasure to see people with such a high level of commitment working to advance and spread agendas that they consider important. And you all have done this wonderfully. Then, of course, I would like to thank all participants of the WQ contest we need more people like you to remind the world that the internet is not just made up of conflicts and nasty stuff, but it is also a colossal source of information and knowledge with a higher level of accessibility than on any other tool in existence today. The internet has enabled the development, the development of such beautiful, useful, and interesting ideas. This cannot be seen as a phase of the past, but rather as a continuous process of improvement in which each of us has an active role. Uh, and that's what the competition we were part is about. The open, open knowledge agenda is something that I personally consider an absolute priority in internet governance, which sometimes gets sidelined by other debates driven by concerns that we have. What we have right, uh, right here is an agenda based on hope, represented so well by the efforts and achievements of Wikimedia Foundation projects. I believe we, as youth, should always try to be part of those transformations that promise, promise to bring forth positive changes for the world. This is what our Wiki U contest tries to represent, and this is what we are trying to achieve with our collective strengths and efforts within the IGF Youth Summit. That being said, I would now like to call upon Anusha Alikan, Vice President of Communications at the Wikimedia Foundation,
to say a few words to us as someone who is in the middle of all this wonderful transformation and has been kind enough to come and share with us a bit of her fantastic work. Anusha, thank you very much for coming and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me at this year's Youth Summit. I wanna start by congratulating all of the young people who participated in Wiki Youth. Your contributions add to the body of knowledge across Wikimedia projects that ensure people everywhere have access to the knowledge they need. As Pedro mentioned, I work at the Wikimedia Foundation, the global nonprofit that supports Wikipedia and 12 other free knowledge projects. It's an incredibly timely moment for me to be here speaking with all of you. This year, Wikipedia celebrates its 20th birthday. Wikipedia was born at a time when there was so much optimism for what technology and the internet could deliver, breaking down socioeconomic and educational barriers and handing people the power to learn and connect across borders and backgrounds. While a lot has changed in the last 20 years, our projects still exist in this spirit. Run by a nonprofit, free from commercial interests and ads and algorithms, Wikipedia has grown to over 56 million articles in more than 300 languages. There are now 13 free knowledge projects that are part of the Wikimedia movement, including Wikidata, which powers information across all. These projects are modeled on the need to uphold transparency and protect user privacy. They are connected by a common belief that knowledge is a human right, that when people have access to it, they make more informed decisions, build more just societies and foster deeper connections. That is the magnitude of the work that you are doing as part of the Wiki Youth Project. We often remark with a sense of gratitude at Wikimedia Foundation, how amazing it is that Wikipedia exists in practice because it could never exist in theory. It is after all an encyclopedia that anyone can edit and 280,000 people do. Whether on Wikipedia or Wikidata, volunteer editors protect our sites ensuring that the information added is neutral and based on reliable sources. They also make edits that are open for all to see. As for-profit technology companies struggle to balance their bottom line with the need to prevent bad information from spreading, grappling with demands for more transparency, Wikimedia volunteers are guided by rules rooted in the public interest. These standards are designed to ward against vandalism and misinformation using the power of AI to detect and revert bad edits, but combining this with human oversight. It is this coupling of technology with a distinctly human approach that has made Wikipedia work for the last 20 years and created a model for others to follow. For the success of Wikipedia and other projects shows us the power of human collaboration. Wikimedia projects now house the largest collection of open knowledge in human history. This is a remarkable achievement and it is a collective achievement, one that belongs to all of us. At the same time, we acknowledge that we're not finished. One of two pillars of Wikimedia's strategy to achieve for 2030 is knowledge equity. There are huge gaps in our projects in recording the experiences of much of the world. Only 18% of biographies on English Wikipedia are about women. These content, ga these content gaps are also most evident in the telling of stories from the global majority. We are working with volunteers to break down structures of power and privilege to change this so we can achieve our mission of ensuring every human has access to the sum of all knowledge. I remember one of my first edits to Wikipedia. It was actually not too long ago. I had read that Naomi Wadler, a passionate youth activist against gun violence, had given a speech at the 2020 Davos Economic Forum. Her Wikipedia page didn't make any reference to her appearance at the global event, so I added it. It's a heady feeling to realize that your contribution will be seen and then built on by all of the people who visit the Wikimedia projects. In my case, making the article of this remarkable young woman stronger also gave me joy. 
Wikipedia and its sister projects, including Wikidata, are pillars of the open internet. One where we are encouraged to be active participants, not just digital consumers. At Wikimedia Foundation, our advocacy work focuses on bringing people back to those ideals, pushing lawmakers to consider models rooted in social good when sorting out thorny questions around regulation and providing other online platforms with lessons in creating digital spaces that democratize access to information and distribute power. Unfortunately, we're at a moment where threats to digital rights are rising and free access to information online is at risk. Globally, we see that censorship, surveillance, and internet blocks are expanding. And as policymakers explore legislation to curb harmful content online, they must take into account projects that exist for the public good. Technology regulation should be designed to support free expression build more informed communities, foster public discourse, and allow the open and free exchange of knowledge. In this moment, the role we choose to play on the internet is more important than ever. I know I started this by marveling at all of the contributions that you've made through the Wiki Youth Contest. Your contributions to Wikidata will help fill in knowledge gaps across languages and open data sets, but we can and must do more. The future of the internet will require more from us than edits. Your presence at the Youth Summit is an incredible first step. The institutions of the internet, the institutions that are here as part of the internet governance forum need more champions of the open internet. They need you. With your leadership, we can advocate for digital rights that are driven by our shared values. Values such as access, equity, and transparency. We can remix, remake, and shape the way that digital platforms support and influence our lives for generations to come. We can build the future of the internet we want to see. Thank you and congratulations again. Thank you so much, Anusha. Um, uh, we had a video and a few words to say about the winners, but we can't do that right now because we're short on time. So we will just say the names and alias. Uh, the winner of the the key of contest is Da Supremo, alias of Faiso Ali. The second place is Nana Yobotar. Uh, the name is Stefan Decky. The third place is Joseph Anthony. That it's his real name, Joseph Anthony. And the fourth place is uh, Rodrigo Morales, which has, which has an unpronounceable <laughs> alias. Uh, the other winners will be announced in private. So I give the mic back to Emilia. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, but uh, maybe you should be giving it back to Emilia, as as I just mentioned them as the real hosts of that event. And um, speeding you up, I left myself probably like 30 more seconds. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much. Um, it was uh, unbelievable how, how much of it you had to share. I'm really sorry we did not have several more hours to share that, but you ha still have time. Um, afterwards, they say that those... Uh, backstage meetings bring more than those official ones. So um, enjoy this afternoon and the evening. Thank you very much.